Our next speaker will be on both of our political panels tomorrow. And he is one of the, my favorite speakers of recent years. He brings in incredible vision and common sense to uh, political topics. And he's also got a wonderful sense of humor in the debates, as you will see tomorrow. Charles Krauthammer was born in New York City and raised in Montreal, educated at McGill University, majoring in political science and economics, Oxford University, Commonwealth Scholar in Politics, and Harvard, an MD in 1975. Practiced medicine for three years as a resident, then chief resident in psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. Obviously a real renaissance man in the making here, but he quit that practice in 1978 to come to Washington to uh, begin to become involved in the political spectrum and writing about it. His first uh, weekly column in the Washington Post was in 1985 in January, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Commentary in 1987. He was also the winner of the 1984 National Magazine Award for his essays. I just want to read one paragraph from his writings here before I uh, introduce him. A column that you read in a newspaper is not just political philosophy and not just partisanship. He quotes, much of it has to do with common sense. One of my many missions is putting up a first line defense against the various enthusiasms of our age. Everything from the nuclear freeze to identity politics to the recovered memory movement, which all tend to roll over the culture at regular intervals. The subject is very timely. It's down to the wire next week's election and America's future. Please welcome back to New Orleans, Charles Krauthammer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Good to be among the 53%. See, Romney has to pretend he didn't mean it. I don't. <laughs> I was listening to that kind introduction about the fashions of the day. I think I said that about 10 or 20 years ago, but the big fashion of the day of our time was actually Barack Obama in 2008. That was one that sort of washed over the culture, and now we're getting a, we're getting a second shot at that fashion. I know that many of you were here last year and the year before, so I won't bore you entirely with a, re a recap of that, but I think it's very important to know what's going to happen in 10 days, to look back to the beginning of the Obama years to frame where we are now. And the way I presented it in the past, this is a quite epic three-act play. The last four years have been an incredibly intense time in terms of our national debate. And even though people complain about the rancor and all the screaming and the yelling and the gridlock, and incidentally, with Obama in office, gridlock is what you want. <laughs> <laughs> gridlock is the ideal until you get the right guy in office. So I've never complained about the gridlock. I want, uh, if Obama's reelected, I'm going to look for four years of it. But let's go back to 2008. This guy comes out of nowhere. And he sets off, and I do give him credit for ambition and for intellectual honesty. He sets off a four-year debate because of his ambitious left-wing agenda, which he then goes out to actually enact. He doesn't just talk about it. A four-year debate, which we have been involved in, on the most fundamental issue that any democracy can face. We've had debates about Obamacare, about cap and trade, about deficits and debt. All of these issues, all the debates that we've been having are all fundamentally subsets of one issue, one question, which is what should be the size, the scope, the range, the power of government? And to put it in larger terms, what is the nature of the American experiment? What is the nature should be the nature of the social contract between citizen and state. And what Obama did by introducing this agenda, and incidentally when he did it, in his first address to a joint session of Congress 
in February of 2009. Now, you don't remember it because you actually have real lives. I, for my sins, and they are many, have to follow every word this man has said since 2008. <laughs> I have a sense that just having to live through that ought to be at least a partial atonement for my sins, but <laughs> I'll leave that up to higher authorities to decide. He basically said, I'm not here to tinker, I'm not here to reform, I'm not here to change things around the edges. I'm here to fundamentally transform America. And he doesn't speak in generalities. He goes out and says exactly what he's going to do. He's going to do it in three areas, healthcare, education, and energy. Think about that. Healthcare, one-sixth of the economy. Education is the future, and energy is the sinews of an industrial society. You control the pricing and production. You've controlled everything. And that's what they've set out to do, to control. He's had partial success, Obamacare, which will set us on the road to national health care. Cap and trade, he didn't succeed, but he passed a trillion dollar stimulus. They've been doing unbelievable amounts of energy regulation, having failed with cap and trade in the Congress through administrative actions and regulation. One regulation is issued early in the year. As you all know, is the death knell of coal. We, under these regulations, we will never again have a new coal fired power plant, simply uneconomical. They know it, and we will be retiring about a sixth of our coal plants by the year 2020, and there's going to be no return. So they've been able to enact a lot through legislative fiat. One example you all know about, they tried to pass the DREAM Act through Congress, this thing which, however you feel about the policy, which is to essentially legalize the status of children brought here before the age of 16, illegally to make them legal. Uh, whatever you think about the policy, the Congress was presented with the bill, the Congress said no, and then they went ahead and essentially enacted it unilaterally by the executive through executive order, which I think is a great example of lawlessness. Um, it's re been repeated over and over again. They passed a regulation earlier this year on a Friday afternoon, hoping no one would see it, which has essentially gutted the work requirement in welfare reform, which was the greatest achievement in social legislation of our time, cut child poverty by a third, cut the welfare rolls by a half, while increasing the general well-being of the very population they were after. They tried to get a killing of the work requirement when they reauthorized the law in 2006. That's liberals. They failed, knowing they'd never have a chance to do it through legislation. The Obama administration has done it again by regulation. This is how they govern, by regulation. So people say, well, even if Obama gets reelected, he's not going to have control of the House. We know that. He won't be able to do much. He will. They will continue this kind of lawless transformation of the country. And the killing of coal is a big deal. The DREAM Act is a big deal. A lot of these items which they are doing sub rosa through uh, executive action are big deals. They will do it through executive action, through regulation, and they'll be, um, it will be enacted essentially into our lives and unrepealable. So that's part of what's at stake. Obama then, he goes out to change the country. And what's so interesting to me is that that sets off Act Two. Act Two is the counter-reaction. And it was quite remarkable because it came out of nowhere. It was not led by anyone. The Republican Party didn't lead it at all. There was no individual, there was no Reagan who led this. This was the Tea Party, came out of nowhere, spontaneous, unorganized, disorganized, grassroots, and sort of takes over uh, like a prairie fire through the country to the point where at the end of Act Two, which is Election Day in 2010, you get one of the most astonishing results in U.S. history. You got what Obama himself called a shellacking for the Democrats, clearly an expression from the American electorate, we don't want to go left, 
We don't want to go the way of Europe. We don't want to be a social democracy. We can see where that leads. You're leading us there. You did it through a little bit of trickery with Obamacare. You're trying to do it through these kinds of regulations. Somebody said the 2010 election was less an election than a restraining order, <laughs> which it was, because it stopped the Obama agenda in its tracks. And what's interesting about the election, first of all, was that the, the Democrats lost 63 seats, the most in 70 years. They lost six seats in the Senate. They lost independence by 21 points. But the most important thing, which was overlooked immediately after the election, was that Democrats lost 680 seats in the state houses. 19 of the 99 state houses flipped from Democratic control to Republican. Most famously, as we then saw in Wisconsin. Wisconsin was a way of telling us what was so important about the 2010 election that the rebellion against this kind of left-wing social democratic agenda at the national level, and the rebellion was shown by the change of hands in Congress, had now spread to the state level. 19 state houses switching hands, the most in 100 years. States like Wisconsin, classically progressive and liberal, with a Republican governor, Republican House, Republican Senate, and Wisconsin, the place that in 1959 became the first state to allow, public, uh, to allow public sector unions to form, becomes the beacon of the movement to curb the corrupt power of the public sector unions in which they pour tons of money into the campaigns of Democratic uh, governors and legislators who in turn give them sweetheart contracts with extraordinary benefits for the members that the private sector workers do not have, which in turn leads to the worker support for the Democrats in a symbiosis that has gone on for 50 years, until now, until Walker, until Wisconsin, until 2010, and you get this revolution in the grassroots. Indiana, for example, becomes a right to work state, the first in decades in the Midwest to switch. So now you've got a real struggle going on. At the national level, you get the, the Democrats entrenched, entrenched by the results of the 2008 election where they had these majorities. The opposition, again, spontaneous, in a sense, driving the Republicans. I mean, one of the most important political developments of our time is the fact that the Tea Party was successfully absorbed by the Republican Party. That was not preordained. It could very easily have remained outside the party. It could very easily have become a challenge to the party. It could very easily have therefore split the conservative opposition to Obamaism, which would have been a boon to the Democrats and kept them in power indefinitely. But the Republican Party proved malleable enough, adaptable enough to absorb it, absorb a lot of its candidates. Some were good, some were not. But it, not, and it also absorbed the energy of the Tea Party. So that set us up for Act Three, which is what we're in now. This is going to be the resolution. You know, it's classic. It's classic uh, uh, theater where you get the action and the reaction, and now we're going to get the resolution. So here we are. We're going to be. This is all going to be over on November sixth. We are now in Act Three, Scene Twelve. Now in Hamlet, everybody dies in the last scene. <laughs> I'm hoping only half the people die. You know? <laughs> if anybody is tweeting it, could you please make clear that was a metaphor? <laughs> I don't want to see Secret Service in here with handcuffs. <laughs> Incidentally, didn't you really hope in that second debate the town hall where those two guys were in the ring and dancing around each other, kind of <laughs> duking it out. And didn't you really secretly hope to see them actually come to blows? <laughs> the way I saw it, 
they really start at each other. Secret Service comes tearing out from the side, tackles Romney, pins him to the ground, and Candy Crowley jumps out and administers the 10 count. Wouldn't that have, wouldn't that have just been like the greatest moment in American politics? That was apropos nothing, but I just had to share that with you. The fantasies I have, I mean, I, I, I've got serious problems when those Candy Crowley administering the 10 count, I don't know where that comes from, but anyway. All right, so we're now act three, we're getting late. What's remarkable to me is that when I was here a year ago, this election was over. The Republicans had won this election. There was no way you could see Obama even competing. And the reason is the economy was a mess. He didn't have a program. And the Republicans had all the energy. Now it's a dead heat, right now. If I had to bet the House, I'd bet Romney, but it's pretty close right now. And things will change in the next week or so in ways we can't predict. But this really was an eminently, easily winnable election. So what happened? The first thing that happened was the Republican primaries. The Republican brand was deeply damaged by the primaries. And the main reason is that we got a very weak field. And the great irony is that there was a tremendously strong field that remained on the sidelines. I don't think there's any cosmic explanation for why the, you know, the really the major leaguers stayed on the sideline and the AAA team was out there. Because the ones who were quite, I mean, imagine if you'd seen on the stage, instead of a Romney and the Seven Dwarfs, I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but I have to speak the truth. Imagine it had been Romney with Mitch Daniels, Chris Christie, Marco Rubio, Bobby Jindal, Ricky Haley, um, and Jeb Bush. Now, Jeb is a special case. He's one of the great Republicans and I think would have made a great president. He clearly has one problem, and that's his last name. So I've actually suggested that he change his last name. <laughs> and what I've come up with is Jeb Ochocinco, <laughs> which I think it works. I th I think it works at two levels. It gets Hispanics and wide receivers at the same time. <laughs> now, each of these was just not ready to run. There was no cosmic reason. It wasn't that Obama was such a formidable candidate they didn't want to run. In 1992, people were so, 91, I would say, for the Democrats, they thought George Bush the first was such a strong candidate. Remember, he just won the Gulf War that nobody of any stature challenged him, and that's how you got a Clinton who went ahead and ran, and he, he it was a long shot. But that was a year when people thought the incumbent is too strong, we're not going to run against him. That's not the reason these top-notch candidates didn't run. It just happened that in each of their lives, it was not the right time. For most of them, they were just a little bit too young. Rubio, two years in the Senate. Christie, two years as governor. Uh, Ryan, who of course is on the ticket, but I mean, who looks like he's 12. Um, he probably thought he's a little too early, even though he'd been in Congress, I think, 14 years. Um, Jindal had his own reasons. Nikki Haley also very young. Mitch Daniels had other problems. So for reasons that were quite disparate and unconnected, they didn't show up. Instead, we had 20 debates with people who weren't of the first rank. I'll say that to be charitable. And it was clear that on that stage, there was only one man who was a plausible president. That was Romney, and, and he won the nomination, which was a good thing. But 20 debates with those candidates did not do the brand any good. Uh, so that was number one. The other thing is that the candidate who emerged, Mitt Romney, is a very odd candidate to run in these circumstances. Let me try to explain why. Let me just say at the beginning, I think he's a fine man. I think he's an honorable man. I think he's an extremely competent man. And I think if he were to become president, he will make an excellent president, perhaps one of the more outstanding presidents in our history. But he's not that good a candidate. And he isn't that good a fit for this year. And the reason is this. 
If you were designing a Republican strategy for 2012, what you would say is, to the extent that we can recapitulate 2010, we're going to win, and we're going to win big. So make 2012 as much like 2010 as you can when the Republicans scored a historic victory over the Democrats, which would suggest an ideological campaign. 2010 was the most ideological election since 1980, meaning it was about the big issues. It was about the size, the scope, the reach of government. The, uh, the, the great debate set off by Obama's election and by the way he's pursued this ambitious left-wing agenda. And when you frame the argument in that way, Obamacare's intrusiveness, cap and trade trying to get control of energy, stimulus spending out of control, leaves not a trace, doesn't do a thing for the economy. You take on all the ideological beliefs and tenets of liberals, you crush them in a real election. Why? Because every time the Gallup samples the electorate and asks them for their ideological affiliation, the answer is always the same. 20% liberal, 40% conservative, 36 or so percent moderate. The other 4% have no idea what the hell's going on. <laughs> but you cannot govern a country successfully and hope ever to be reelected re running on the base of 20% of the population, which is what Obama did in the first term. He and Harry Reid and all the you know, old lion liberals in the Congress wanted to impose a left-wing agenda and the country spoke in 2010. So, if you're planning out 2012, you say, let's do it again. What's the, the difference between a 2010 election and a 2012? Well, there's now a presidency involved, there's now a personality involved, there's now an individual involved around whom the race revolves. So it's less ideological, there's this mixture of the personal and the ideological. Now, of all the candidates who could have been on the stage, the ones I enumerated as the, you know, really outstanding first team, Romney is the least ideological. Now, I believe he's a conservative. I believe he says what he means. I completely believe that he will try to enact the agenda he's enunciated, which is a very conservative um, a, a, agenda. It will be driven in part by the House, by the energy from the House, by Republicans in the Senate. If Obama wins the presidency, it's in, almost inconceivable that the Republicans will not win at least a majority of the Senate. So I could see this as a real conservative administration. However, he's not a man with a conservative history or even sort of a conservative mindset. I remember during one of the debates, trying to impress the other candidates with how conservative he said. He said, I ran a severely conservative administration. It's an odd locution. Severe is a word usually associated with head wounds and tropical storms, <laughs> not with governance. And it was a little bit of a tip that for a Romney, conservatism is a second language. He speaks it rather well, but he doesn't speak it that fluently. Um, I remember also in the debates, uh, Newt was attacking Romney as a Johnny come lately. Where were you during the revolution? And Newt was a genuinely, a genuine conservative hero. He's the guy who took the House for Republicans for the first time in 40 years. He was there at creation. He was there who sort of launched the, the renaissance of the movement. And Romney simply very honestly said, I was a businessman. I was not in politics. I spent a quarter of a century in business. It's a very honorable way to spend one's life. And then I came to government to uh, politics later. And it shows. So when it came to carrying out the great debate about the relationship between citizen and state, Romney was the least equipped to make that case. So his campaign decided that they would not run that way. They were going to run not on ideology, but on stewardship. Now, that's not a bad idea, because this administration has been so clearly 
of failure on just about every front, and most clearly a failure on the issue that affects most people, and that is far and away the number one issue in anyone's mind that you see in any poll, namely the economy. You know, when you've racked up uh, $16 trillion worth of debt, adding about four to five million in four years, Rick Perry had the best line of the primaries when he said the question that ought to be posed in the election is, are you better off than you were $5 trillion ago? <laughs> so they're going to run on that, on debt, the most anemic recovery since the Second World War. At this time in the Reagan recovery, growth was about 7 8%. We just got the latest third quarter number, 2%. You average it over the year, it's about 1.7% which is a recovery that can't even keep unemployment steady. Unemployment will rise under that kind of growth rate. So terrible debt, terrible recovery, and 43 months in a row of 8% unemployment, and worse than that, the highest chronically unemployed level ever recorded, which means people out of work for more than six months. 40% of the unemployed been out of work for more than six months. That's about twice the norm in a recession. And it means there's an entire generation of older Americans who have lost their jobs, who will never work again. And the thing that you don't see in the numbers is the huge decrease in the size of the workforce, because so many people have dropped out permanently. Which, of course, as you know, because of the way that we do our numbers, artificially lowers the unemployment rate. Because the minute someone stops looking for work out of despair, instead of it being recorded as a negative for the incumbent, it gets recorded as taking somebody out of the workforce. So it decreases the denominator in looking at employment and therefore artificially lowers the unemployment rate. So it makes it look better. But Obama can't run on his record. He knows that. And you can't even run on his achievements because they appeal to such a narrow liberal base. Do you ever hear him, do you ever see any ads touting Obamacare? Do you ever hear, ever hear him even say the word stimulus? In his last State of the Union address, he didn't mention the stimulus, and he gave Obamacare one sentence. Can't run on his record, can't run on his legislative achievements, and now he can't run on a program for the future, because he doesn't have one. The way I see it, his program consists of saving the big bird and making sure that Sandra Fluck has free contraceptives. <laughs> worthy, worthy goals. I may comment on her in the question period, but I would digress to the point where you'd never be able to get me back. So. Worthy goals, but not exactly the kind that match the size of the challenges that we're facing, which is not only a fiscal cliff, but an economic cliff. We are looking at the face of Greece. By the grace of God, we've got about five years between now and then. I mean, you know, it, when, when Reagan was rising, and Reagan made the conservative case against the kind of left-wing policies the Democrats were proposing, it was all quite theoretical, because you could look at Europe and say, look, they're full-fledged entitlement states, full-fledged social democracies, and they're doing rather well. So we would argue hypothetically whether the Reagan path or the liberal democratic path was more, was more amenable to growth, to success, social justice, etc. It's no longer a theoretical argument. It's an empirical argument, and the argument is over. We are actually, here's the great irony. We're living through a period when history has demonstrated in front of our eyes the absolute abject failure of the social democratic entitlement state to model as embodied in Europe, in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, in Italy, and it will spread to the northern states as well. And we, not, we managed to elect in 2008 the first president in U.S. history ever to aspire to a complete adaptation of the American experiment 
to become near identical to what's happening in Europe, precisely at the time when history has refuted the European experience. So we have this gift of this five years or so between now and then, and that's why this really is the most important election of our lifetime. Now, I know you've heard this all your life, and I have every election is the most important election of your lifetime. This one is. It's surely the most important election since 1980. And the reason is this. If Barack Obama loses, then his four years will be a parenthesis in American history. The way history will be written is that for 50 years from FDR to the end of the 70s, you had a liberal ascendancy. Then came Reagan, we had three decades of a conservative ascendancy. And then, if Obama loses, he's a parenthesis. What he does will have been written on sand, and we will continue this conservative ascendancy. If he wins, even if it's only for one more term that his kind of his brand of liberalism is in control, we will be on an irrevocable course towards Europe. Obamacare will become absolutely institutionalized, and I guarantee you that in 10 years, because of its inefficiencies, its insanities, its bureaucracies, its complexities, the only way to go will be to a single-payer system, as in Canada or Britain. We will have that within 10 years. And once you have that, you have one-sixth of the economy controlled by the government, literally controlled at every level by the government, and not only a sixth of the economy, the sixth of the economy that affects you and your children and your family most intimately. You change the nature of the citizen and state. The level of dependency becomes very different. And you end up with the kind of mindset that dominates in Europe. Where, for example, when Sarkozy managed to pass a hike in the retirement age from 60 to 62, there were, the next day, student riots in the streets. Think about that. These are people who've never even held a job, who are rioting over the fact that 40 years hence, they may have to work an extra two years. <laughs> Greece, by the way, has a law in which hazardous employment allows one to retire at 50. I've checked the category of hazardous employment. It includes radio announcers. <laughs> I think they mean the germs on the microphone, but I'm not exactly sure. You know, we're not talking coal mining here. We're talking, and hairdressers. And I thought I missed my calling. If I'd been a Greek hairdresser, I'd be retired by now <laughs> and sunning myself on a beach in the Adriatic. Instead, I'm here. That kind of dependency becomes ingrained, and that's why I think this could be an election which will have an effect on the nature of the citizenry and on the nature of the social contract. So that's what's at stake. But Romney's not the guy to make that case. So he's run a very steady campaign, very disciplined campaign, to run on stewardship, meaning I'm a businessman, I'm a turnaround artist, I understand the economy, the other guy hasn't even run a candy store, and when he tried to run the U.S. economy, he's driven into the ground. That's not a bad argument. The only question is, is it enough? So he decides to run this way. They come out of the primaries somewhat damaged, a lot of negative advertising. A lot of negative advertising, one against the other. There's one point I want to make about negative advertising, which is that people wonder why politicians are held in such low esteem by the population. You know, Congress is at about 11% Saddam country, you know. And the reason is, I mean, some people say it's because they're a bunch of lying, cheating thieves. I don't think that's enough of an explanation. <laughs> I think you got to add one more factor. There is no industry in the United States, none other than politics, which indulges in negative advertising. Think about this. Imagine that the airlines did negative advertising. <laughs> All right? So you see an ad. This is how it shows. They show the scene of a plane crash. And they say, you want to die? Fly Delta. 
I guarantee you that in two weeks, if you want to drive, if you want to go from LA to New York, you'll pack the car. <laughs> Nobody would fly. And they're all surprised why do people hate politicians? Because all of them portray the others, you know, it's child abusing monsters, and they're surprised that they're not in high esteem. The thing about the campaign this year is that Obama had no way to run on his stewardship, no way to run on the future. So the campaign was entirely, and this was actually the title of a memo in August of 2011 called Kill Romney. It was all about negative advertising. And negative advertising works. On the eve of the first debate, Mitt Romney had the highest negatives of any challenger in 30 years. He was at 51% negative. But there's one Achilles heel to negative advertising. Negative advertising works only until and unless it meets reality. And that's why the first debate between Obama and Romney was an earthquake. All of a sudden, after hearing about this guy, Romney, being a Gordon Gecko type, rapacious capitalist who wants to raise taxes on the middle class, that was a staple of all the ads, and lower taxes on the rich. They hear about this now for six months, and the Romney campaign did not respond. The guy shows up on stage. He's reasonable. He's authoritative. He's non-threatening. And then he buries Obama with an avalanche of facts to undo the calumnies about what his program was supposedly about. He's going to be cutting taxes on the middle class, not raising them. And about the rich, he made very clear what liberals have a really hard time understanding, that there's a distinction between tax rates and tax revenue that of course he wanted to lower tax rates for everyone, including the upper income folks. But if you then broaden the base by eliminating deductions and exemptions, to which incidentally the rich have more access than anybody else, then you can end up revenue neutral. And he said, one of the pledges I make is that the upper 5% will pay the same share of total taxes, namely 60%, that they do today. So what he was saying is, I want to do what Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and Rostenkowski and Bill Bradley did in 1986, which was to pass tax reform, lower the rates, broaden the base, eliminate deductions, which was the single most successful piece of tax legislation in 50 years and launched a quarter century of prosperity. He made that case in the first six minutes. And just by the fact that he could walk out on stage without horns after being portrayed as this monster. Do you remember the ad they were running? Steelworker's wife, a laid off steelworker. Wife dies of cancer. Essentially the ad blames Romney, who through Bain had owned the steel plant. Of course, Romney wasn't even involved, but that's irrelevant. This ad shows the widow were looking right at the camera and saying Mitt Romney didn't care, meaning about his wife dying. He doesn't care about anybody. So after an ad like that, all you have to do is show up on stage and show that you have two arms and two legs and a human heart, and you've diffused it, and Romney did much better. And that was the single most important debate in US history. Here's what's so interesting about it. It's not just that it caused the biggest swing ever seen in polling. Romney won that debate by 52 points. He won by seven to one. But here's the most interesting part. He won that debate without there being a moment. When you think of debates that were won or lost in the past, they've always been either about a gaffe or a zinger, right? Gerald Ford saying in 1976, um, Eastern Europe is not under the domination of the Soviet Union, but then he made it worse, and never will be under a Ford administration. That was a big mistake from which he never recovered. And then there are the zingers you all remember. 
I knew Jack Kennedy, you're no Jack Kennedy, the humiliating thing that Lloyd Benson did. Or Reagan's brilliant 1980 remark to Jimmy Carter when he accused him of sundry or other. Oh, there you go again. Where Reagan showed himself to be avuncular and reasonable, non-threatening after he'd been portrayed the same way Romney was. Except Reagan was portrayed as a crazy right-wing warmonger who was just itching to get into the Oval Office so he could drop a bomb on Moscow. So Reagan shows up and says, oh, shucks, there you go again. The election was over. People don't remember that Carter was ahead until the last month. And it was that remark, that debate that changed things. But the Romney debate had no moment. It was Romney defusing $150 million worth of advertising in 90 minutes. So that changed the whole trajectory of the election. It had been very stable. Not a lot of movement ever since Romney won the nomination. Then there was one event, the Republicans wasted their convention in Tampa. I still don't understand that Clint Eastwood shtick. And the Democrats had a successful Charlotte, a successful convention from which they came out five points ahead. And that was the margin, which they kept right up until the first debate. And the first debate changed everything. In an election like this, where you clearly have a failed incumbent, the only question is, and the electorate is ready to throw him out, but they won't throw him out if they think that the challenger does not meet the threshold to be an acceptable president. Reagan passed the threshold with his, there you go again, avuncular, non-threatening thing in the debate. And then he won by a landslide. And Romney passed the threshold in the first debate. People saw him as reasonable. He was not the rapacious, greedy, heartless, unfeeling capitalist he'd been portrayed. And he could defeat all the arguments people had heard about his economic program, unfiltered by the media. Uh, so it was a resounding change of momentum. So what Romney did is to wipe out the bounce, the five pound bounce, from Charlotte and more. That's where we are today. If you look at the latest national polls, Romney's up by between one and three, maybe even five. The problem, of course, as you all know, is that there's swing states like Ohio. If you do the electoral college count, Obama's ahead. You look at the national thing, Romney's ahead. Now, there have only been twice in our history where the electoral vote and the popular vote went in different directions. It is quite possible it could happen this way, except when that's happened, the margin of victory in the national vote for the loser, meaning the more he had, was very small. We know in 2000 it was one, you know, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 1%. It was hanging chads in Florida. If Romney's ahead by one point or more in national vote, to me it's almost inconceivable that he can lose in the Electoral College. It's possible, but the odds are very small. So, if you're not sleeping well at night, because you've added up all the Electoral College votes, just remember that. If he's up by 1%, surely by 1.5%, and he's up by more than that now, it is nearly inconceivable that he can lose the election. So I leave you that because I hate to leave my audiences depressed. <laughs> it's true that when I do that, I offer the audience, at the end, since I'm still a licensed psychiatrist, to write prescriptions for anybody who needs antidepressants. <laughs> but I'm not sure I can do that in Louisiana, so I'd rather end on a high note, but I will tell you a true story. I gave a talk in Little Rock on the day of the first debate. I asked the organizers if I could give it a little earlier so I could then run over to Fox Studios in Little Rock, do the commentary on the debate. He said, fine. So I gave this talk at six o'clock. Now remember where you were, um, sort of psychologically, six o'clock on the evening of the first debate. Ob Romney was way down, getting crushed in the Electoral College, down by about five in the national the, the campaign is listless, nothing's happening. And my, I was at a meeting with friends a week before. It was like a wake, and the guy hadn't even died yet. 
So I give this talk, which is kind of realistic, and by the end of it, I realize I've done a lot of damage to these people. They're sobbing in the back row, women <laughs> openly weeping. So I did the offer to write the anti-description. I, I left, and then I went to Fox, and I watched the debate. And I did the commentary, and by now I'm high as a kite. I am flying. So I come back to my hotel, and the event's still going on. P.J. O'Rourke is wrapping up the last speech. So I go over to the organizer and say, look, I gotta go back on stage. I can't leave the people this way. <laughs> so they give a note to P.J. He graciously says, we got a special treat. Dr. Kravitz is coming back. I go back on stage and say, ladies and gentlemen, I retract everything I said at six o'clock. <laughs> and I mean, I was flying. So I gave, I don't even remember what I said, but it's a whole new game. We're in it and uh, we really have a chance. And this is where we are right now. Uh, we're very, very much as a knife edge. I do think if the election were held today, Romney would probably win because I believe the national poll. And even though Obama's ahead in Ohio and other places, there's stuff that's hidden in here, and that is the, the enthusiasm gap is still very wide. It's about 8%, which means that there's a sort of 8% of the people who want to go out for Romney are very, very enthusiastic and will absolutely show up. And it's quite a spread over how many would do that for Obama. Obama knows that. Why do you think he's on MTV today? Because he has to appeal to the youth who are not going to show up. So that's a sort of hidden number. Intensity is not measured in the polls. In the, in the telephone polls, because all you got to do is speak to a pollster, intensity is measured on polling day. So that, I think, is a hidden advantage for Obama. And I also tend to think that it's hard for people to, to tell a pollster, I'm going to fire the first African-American president in our history. People just don't want to do that. They don't. Uh, George Will had a very, very nice analogy. He said, the breakthrough in race relations in baseball was not the hiring of Frank Robinson as the first black manager. It was the year he was fired. And when you can do that, then you have real color blindness, a real sense that what matters is results and not color. So I'm, there might be a bit of a residue of that. So I would slightly, t I would take the polls with a slight grain of salt and say that if things were held today, I think we win. But that means no gaps between here and election day. Who the hell knows what the storm is gonna do except it'll be mostly affecting blue states, which I take as a signal from. <laughs> but I dare not say it on tape, lest I be called sacrilegious. Well, I'm, what I'm gonna do is wrap it up on that somewhat optimistic note and uh, open it up to questions. So I think we got about a quarter of an hour. Thank you all very much. Yes, a question out front, which I'll repeat. Um, will, will you comment on the Senate, control of the Senate, uh, how close? Right, um, control of the Senate is the question. Uh, again, a year ago, this was a slam dunk for Republicans. I mean, there were so many Democrats Retiring, to, I think 21 to 22, so few open seats on the Republican side. But there have been a few kind of historical accidents. You know the one in Missouri. That's a hell of a historical accident. This is Claire McCaskill is probably the weakest Democrat running, and her opponent makes this staggeringly offensive and thoughtless statement about intentional rape, uh, from which he hasn't recovered. The Republicans try to wash their hands of him, there's no success. In doing that, he stays in the race. And miraculously, he's still within reach. But that is an example of a seat that should have been won you know, yesterday. Uh, so as a result of that, I think what we're looking at right now is it will depend on what the top of the ticket does. If Romney wins, I see the Republicans winning 51, 52, because it would mean there's a strong enough Republican wave to carry on those, to carry those uh, neck and neck races. Or take the race in Indiana with Murdoch making this, I thought he was sincere and honest in what he said. I think the media took what Murdoch said about uh, a child, an unborn child being the result of rape. 
he did not mean that God willed the rape, but he meant that, which is the doctrine of the Catholic Church, which is not an insignificant institution. Their doctrine is, even if it's the product of rape, still a child of God and needs the same protection as any other child. That's not in any way pro-rape or any way excusing it. It's simply consistency in the matter of life beginning at conception, which is a perfectly respectable philosophical position. In fact, it's more consistent than the position of somebody who opposes abortion on the grounds that life begins at conception and says exceptions for rape and incest. I understand why you would say that, and I'm sympathetic to that view, but it's less philosophically consistent than believing that if the life is a life from conception, why should it be subject to extinction because of the nature of its conception? But anyway, what, I'm, I'm, what I mean to say is he said a very clumsily an important philosophical point. You don't do that in a debate, and you surely don't do it clumsily. The media just tore them apart, and the Democrats are trying to use it against Romney, which is not going to work. But there again is a race. You know, this is the Luger seat in Indiana, which Republicans have held since the earth cooled. Uh, and now it's now in jeopardy. So because of some of those missteps, I think if Obama does win the presidency, which would imply that there's sort of a loss of Republican momentum in the last 11 days, I could see them holding on to the Senate. So I think it's on the knife edge, as is the presidency. Uh, let me just take one in the back. Yes, ma'am, in the blue. Well, uh, did you hear that question? I appreciate the sentiment, and if I could begin by addressing the implication. If nominated, I will not run. <laughs> but if elected, I'll serve. I'm just lazy. I don't want to go through all that. If they want to give me the house and the airplane, I will take it. <laughs> Answer to your question is I'm not I have never been asked, and I would never seek to give them advice privately. So I don't do that. If anybody wants to call me, and if Obama wanted to call and ask for advice, how to help his campaign, I would be honest, you know, and if uh, I would probably say that since I want the other side to win, I'll give you bad advice disguised as good advice. <laughs> but I'd be honorable enough to tell him in advance. Um, no, I, I give all my advice in public and in print, although I'll pick up the phone if anybody wants to ask me anything. Uh, but I don't go looking for it. And uh, look, I have a lot of respect for my colleagues who have millions of contacts in the campaigns, who have the pulse of the campaign, who can speak openly on television and inform people about what they're thinking and, and what they want to do. And my philosophy is since the day I started 30 years ago is the only way to remain, uh, let me use a word that doesn't impugn anybody. The only way to remain um, unindentured to anyone, I'll use an obscure word so I get out of it really, <laughs> you know, just to be on my own is simply not to have those contacts. So if you've ever read me, you know, I've never broken a story in my life. I just like to break people, but not stories, you know. Uh, but I just sort of try to use general information. So the answer's no, but uh, anyway, they don't listen to what I write or say anyway, so I'm not sure it would make a difference if they were over the phone. Yes, sir.
You don't have to change your daughter's opinion, I assure you, that over the next two decades, the Lord will. <laughs> you forget that I was once a speechwriter for Walter Mondale. <laughs> Shock throughout the audience. <laughs> Smelling salts for the woman in line, row 14, please. It's a true story. It was left out of my history. I appreciate that introduction. <laughs> Though that's the, the definition of a kind introduction is when they leave stuff out. Uh, that was left out. Um, people ask me, how do, I go, how do I go from Walter Mondale to Fox News? The answer is simple. I was young once. So the youth vote will change. No, you're absolutely right. And what you've described is the Democratic Party is not a party. It's an association of constituencies. Barack Obama is not running to lead the country. Barack Obama is running to put together, to cobble together, exactly the kind of groups you mentioned. Youth, unmarried women, um, unions, uh, environmentalists, people on the left, the media. I mean, he's got his constituencies. Hispanics, you, you pay him off with the DREAM Act. Uh, African Americans, you pay them off by challenging all the laws about voter ID, even though you know that the Supreme Court held it constitutional by six to three in 2008 in an opinion written by that liberal lion, John Paul Stevens, but you go ahead and do it anyway. So they go after one constituency after another, the free contraceptives, I mean, all the goodies they've been handing out, cutting student loan rates in half again for students. So they are a coalition of interests. The Republicans are not really. They're more of a national party. They make a case, lower your taxes, deregulation. They make a case for how to bring the country forward. They have their constituencies, but that's not how they run. That's not how they conceive of themselves. It's not who they are. I mean, the, you know, if you're a Democrat, you own the trial lawyers and they own you. You get a 2,800-page health care reform, the biggest health care reform in American history, and there is not a single serious proposal on tort reform, which is the single greatest destroyer of our health care system and the single greatest ca uh, cause of unnecessary costs, lawsuits, etc. but not touched. Why? Because the trial lawyers own the party. So that is a problem. You, what your question is, does that constituency simply through demographics grow to the point where they control the government permanently? possible, which is why I think this is an important election. You want to reverse that psychology. But there's no reason why Hispanics should be intrinsically democratic, maybe the first generation, but over time as they become more integrated the way all uh, immigrants do by the second and third, their voting patterns will likely begin to mirror the general population. There's no reason why, you know, youth will necessarily be always left. I mean, they clearly they're more idealistic and they tend to be, if I could be uncharitable, more naive and ignorant of the world till they grow up and then they look around and they see how the world's like. But it doesn't have to be that way. And look at the change between 2008 and today. I mean, they went lockstep like lemmings for Obama in 2008. Now, you don't see him swooning in the aisles today. You don't even hear MSNBC anchors express thrills up their legs today. <laughs> but I do think that the biggest scandal in our society is how unvarnishedly, unashamedly, openly the biased the media are. I'll give you... You don't have to go into history for this. This week, maybe earlier in the week, Fox News breaks the story of the emails that were sent on the day of the Libya events. The emails that show that they had said within hours that the local Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda affiliate had claimed credit for the attack, which contradicts the Democratic story. So it's all over Fox. There were a few other outlets that talked about it. The New York Times not only didn't have a story on that, they had three stories that day about Murdoch of Indiana and the abortions thing. I mean, ask yourself what kind of judgment that is. Even the ombudsman for the New York Times attacked their own newspaper for their bias, saying, for example, 
that their coverage of the Occupy Wall Street movement was not so much coverage as encouraging and promoting a cause. And actually, it's interesting, the Tea Party movement, which was ignored and then denigrated and then ridiculed and then attacked by the press relentlessly, has endured and is a great important part of American public life. Whereas Occupy Wall Street, as I predicted at the time, which was a confection and creation of the media, sort of went away, was blown away by the first snows of winter. So in the end, reality shows itself. Occupy was never real, created by the media, and it blew away. But in the short run, like elections, where what you cover is important, there has been a scandalous underreporting of the Libya thing, which is really almost incomprehensible. And obvious overemphasis on anything that could be used to embarrass the Republicans. Now, the problem is that's a fact of life. It's not a conspiracy, it's self-selection. Left tends to go into to things like journalism or the academic, academia, and people who are more conservative go into business, like most of you, create a real life, real value, real employment, and become the sector of society that produces the surplus wealth off which the other guys live. And your question is, in the end, who's going to predominate over whom? Well, I think this election will go a long way in determining that. We'll take one more question. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the front. No, on the question of Obama and Romney, the press will not be fickle. They have planted their flag. They are so heavily invested in Obama, in part to sort of vindicate how much totally over the top they were in 2008. It would be kind of an admission that they got it wrong the first time around and they misled the country the first time around and they ignored questions which are completely legitimate about Obama's past, Jeremiah Wright and... Uh, um, you know, the terrorists he was hanging out with. Um, these, those questions which they studiously ignored, they didn't only ignore them. They made it seem as if anybody who raised them was a racist, so they scared away everybody, including John McCain. John McCain sort of gave orders, this is not to be raised. Perfectly legitimate issues. So they're so heavily invested in this guy. They will not be fickle. They will not change, certainly between not now and election day. They may, for amusement, turn on him after he wins. Let's say the Libya scandal, like Watergate, which began before an election, was sort of under the radar, then explodes after. They may get involved in that for the drama of it, the fun of it. They're going to have their guy in power anyway, so what do they care? I can see that happening, but they will do nothing to jeopardize this guy's victory. And you can see it in the coverage. Look how little they covered Libya today. There's a story every day. Fox is going to have a special... Uh, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, at 1, 3, and 10 Eastern, where they're really going to lay it out in ways that are incredibly embarrassing. And the press isn't even asking questions. So they, I think, have, have decided that they're going with their man and not going to relent. Uh, the one thing I would say is the press has been on the left for all of our lifetime, 50 years. The one blessing we have from the new technology is they used to have a monopoly. Three networks, and that was it. You couldn't get your news anywhere else. Now we have talk radio, we have the Wall Street Journal editorial page, we have the Weekly Standard, and we have Fox News. I, I've always said that the genius of Roger Ailes and Rupert Murdoch in creating Fox News was to discover a small niche in the American news broadcasting audience, half the American people. <laughs> 
which is why they've been such incredible success. I mean, every night we get more than CNN and MSNBC combined, and every night we double them, or I think we quadruple MSNBC uh, to these days, the same with CNN. So there is a constituency, and there are now outlets. So it's more, it's not a level playing field because the major networks still take their orders from the New York Times front page, which is irredeemably liberal to the point where it's almost comical at times how they push it. But I'll leave you with one thing to leave you somewhat optimistic, and that is to go back to the great Bismarck, the best pundit I think there ever was, who once said that God looks after fools, drunkards, children, and the United States of America. <laughs> So, so let's hope that he still does and we win in November. Thank you very much. Thank you.